I have a lot of records, and this is forever goddamn changes. <laughs> Welcome back, or welcome, if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, here on my channel, over on my Instagram, and now over on TikTok. You guys yelled at me enough, so I finally got on the clock app. You can follow that in my description below. Today is a special episode of Vinyl Monday. This is the 20,000 subscriber special. In about a year and a half of doing this, I've gained an audience, which in and of itself is amazing, but you guys appreciate the music I do, you value the history as much as I do, you respect my and each other opinions most of the time. You tolerate me shouting at things, even finding it entertaining sometimes. But what I value the most is your loyalty, and I'm not even sure how to phrase this, but you guys allow me the space to weave myself and my life into this music that's been around for over 50 years. That is truly unique to this audience and truly special. I didn't mention this last week when I talked about the slow dive gig, but that night also marked a very special milestone. On the night I hit 20,000 subscribers, yes it happened while I was at Slow Dive, one of my Boston viewers came up and said hi to me. I was recognized in public for the first time? That was surreal and a highlight of an already amazing night. Thank you all so much for believing in what I do here. On to this week's album. So I usually make a game out of guessing what album I'm gonna cover next to play along. All you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where all the hints go. I host polls over there. And sometimes you can pick what albums you wanna see. That was the case for this week. There was a bit of a scheduling conundrum that I can't tell any of you about. You voted strongly in favor of the 20,000 subscriber special. So here it is. Forever Changes by Love. Also, can we appreciate that this is the 69th regular episode of Vinyl Monday? I don't know, I think that's funny. This doubles as the first episode of the Vinyl Monday Spooky series, which you also voted strongly in favor of. I'm not going much for literal spooky music, uh, that is, until episode three. More so uh, the mood between Harvest Moon and All Hallows Eve. But now that I think of it, there's few things spookier than a band that famously lived in a silent film star's castle and photographed at Bella Lugosi's place. All right, let's take the plastic off. 
So my copy is a repress sent to my P.O. box by one of you subscribers. I did the stupid thing and I lost the note that this came with. Um, I keep all of the notes that come with P.O. box things just so I remember who sent things and because I'm a sentimental pack rat, I remember it was a Canadian viewer who sent this. I hope I don't wear this phrase out today, but thank you so much. So let's talk about this cover art. Here on the front we have this illustration by Bob Pepper. He did these ridiculous psychedelic covers for classical music recordings. The Debussy and Schubert ones go so unreasonably, unfathomably hard. For the Forever Changes art, Bob took inspiration from the band's name. He drew all of the members' faces into this anatomical heart. And on the back Back cover, we have this photograph by Ronnie Heron. This was taken at Arthur Lee's house on his back patio, and during the shoot, Michael accidentally kicked over a vase and broke it. This photo is Arthur's response holding up the vase like, really, man? But Love liked the shot. The shape of the broken vase kind of looked like the heart on the front cover. On Forever Changes, we have Arthur Lee on vocals and some guitar, not much. Johnny Eccles on lead guitar, Brian McLean on guitar and vocals, Ken Forsey on bass, and Michael Stewart Ware on drums and various percussion. We have some special guests on this one, some familiar faces from the Wrecking Crew. This group of session musicians were favorites among the LA and Laurel Canyon pop groups. We have Don Randy on keys, piano, and harpsichord, Billy Strange on rhythm guitar, Carol Kay on bass, and Hal Blaine on drums. A select group of musicians from the LA Philharmonic were brought in to play the orchestral arrangements by David Angel. The Daily Planet was arranged by Neil Young, Forever Changes was produced by Bruce Botnick with Arthur Lee. Roll the 20,000 subscriber transition. <laughs> So ever since they handed the doors to Elektra Records on a silver platter, things have been a little weird for Love. Love didn't have a great relationship with Elektra to begin with. Arthur Lee had royally pissed off Jack Holzman by lying about his age when he signed the contract. This caused a legal nightmare. Love didn't get promoted the way other groups on the label did. They were an integrated band. The first integrated band playing the Sunset Strip club circuit. When they went on tour, clubs in the South wouldn't book them. And Electra just wasn't backing up love on this. This really affected Arthur. He knew he had to make money as a working musician, but that kind of continued struggle and prejudice and rejection really took a toll on him. This meant Love only really toured within driving distance, uh, but besides, the California scene welcomed them with open arms. Love had not one, but two clubs they would headline regularly. This may all seem like more trouble than it's worth, but you have to understand why Love was with Elektra in the first place. Owning their masters was of great importance to them, and Elektra was the only label willing to do it. Giving credit where credit's due, this principle is respectable, even by today's standards. When you have the biggest pop star in the world having to re-record her entire back catalog just to own her work. The folk boom's been going on in California for a while now, sparked by groups like the Birds and Buffalo Springfield, all those guys. Jack Holzman wants Love to get in on this, which doesn't really make much sense seeing as Elektra had just had big rock hits with The Doors and Love themselves. So he suggests to Arthur that maybe the next record go in a more folk direction. Now, nine times out of 10, or maybe 99 times out of 100, Arthur Lee didn't give a f what the record execs had to say. But for some reason, he really responded to the idea. He did kind of stretch the definition of folk. Having strings and horns on the album was his idea. As for the album title, that was also Arthur. As the story goes, this girl's like, you said you'd love me forever. And Arthur responds with, well, forever changes. Oh my god! 
He said the thing! Now here's where things get a little tricky. Forever Changes was supposed to be a double album. The idea was for Brian to have a whole side of songs, Johnny to have a whole side, and Arthur would get a whole disc since he was the principal songwriter. The guys spent months writing this. Pre-production started pretty much as soon as De Capo was out, but at the last minute, as Love is heading into the studio, Electra goes, hey, so remember the double album? Yeah, that super cool thing you were gonna do? Yeah, it's way too expensive. Sorry guys, we can't do it. But wait a minute, this is a major label we're talking about. Not major like Columbia money, but still, they've become a pretty big deal through 1967. Major labels make double albums all the time. How would this be too expensive? Because Arthur wanted strings and horns. Bringing them in for every session would rack up a big bill fast. So as a compromise, they keep these strings and horns, but Forever Changes is cut down to a single LP. In the process, Brian loses a lot of his songs. It took three months to get Forever Changes hammered out. Sessions started in June and wrapped at the end of September. However, in those three months, Love only logged 60 something hours of time in the studio. Why did it take so long? Well, after Brian had the majority of his songs cut, he straight up refused to play anything Arthur had written, and he took Ken right out with him. So Bruce Botnick, doing his best to play Peacekeeper, but also needing to record an album here, brings in the Wrecking Crew to do what Brian and Ken won't. They hammer out two songs in one day and more again, and The Daily Planet. This session on June 9th, 1967 was a circus. Though Brian and Ken have benched themselves, they're still hanging around in the studio watching the Wrecking Crew do their thing. The stuff Neil Young had arranged was nice, and so was the Wrecking Crew's playing. They're obviously a very talented group, but it still felt off. It just didn't sound like anything Brian or Ken would have come up with themselves. Oh yeah, Neil Young's hanging around too, by the way. There's a rumor he was asked to produce Forever Changes, but both both Neil and Love have denied this. In reality, he was just running out of money and needed something with his name as a credit for some cash, so Bruce had him arrange Daily Planet. Anyway, Ken ends up pulling Carol Kay aside and teaching her what he would have written for the songs. I would not have the balls to do that. This woman played on pet sounds. I think she knows what she's doing, buddy. Arthur and Johnny are standing right there watching Ken redo the work Neil had done. Neil only sticks around for like two hours. Bruce gives him a full producer's salary just to get him out of how horribly awkward all of this was. Considering all of this, after a heart-to-heart, -heart, the process of putting Forever Changes together was surprisingly civil. Arthur wrote lyrics, Brian would write some too, the rest of the guys would write their own parts, and ironing out the final track listing was a group effort. With some minimal input from their crew, Brian originally wrote Alone Again or for the first record, as a bluegrass tune. The banjo player that was supposed to come in that day was late, so Johnny's killing time, noodling around with some flamenco stuff. That's what he'd do to warm up. He was really into that. David Angel overhears this and is like, hey man, that's really great. I could... I could write something like that. The guys convince Brian to rework the song. He obliges as not to have another song cut from the record. They call up the strings and horns and knock out the new Alone Again or in just one day on September 10th. This new Spanish vibe carried over into A House Is Not A Motel. That guitar solo at the end was a total accident. So Johnny lays that first solo down, but when he goes to overdub it, the playback system is busted. So he has two options. Either he goes into the booth to hear what he did and kind of kill the spontaneity of the moment, or he has to play a completely improvised solo from memory. He goes with option number two. While he's pulling this second solo, 
out of his ass. Arthur is in the booth, flailing wildly at him, like, this part's higher, this part's higher, no, no, go lower here, faster, faster! Again, it is a circus in there. But things are still moving at a snail's pace. After getting word of the Wrecking Crew fiasco, I can only imagine Jack's response was something like, oh, for the love of God! He formally steps in, offers love a chunk of change to just please get this thing done, and it's done in all of a week. The Daily Planet, Old Man, and Red Telephone were all finished in the last week of September. The track listing of Forever Changes goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have Alone Again or, followed by A House Is Not A Motel. Then, and more again, next, The Daily Planet, then Old Man, and side one closes with the red telephone. Opening up side two, we have Maybe the People Would Be the Times, or Between Clark and Hilldale, then Live and Let Live. Next, The Good Humor Man Sees Everything Like This. No. The Good Humor Man He Sees Everything Like This, followed by Bummer in the Summer, and the album closes with You Set the Scene. Forever Changes was released on November 1st, 1967, and it was released to, well, nothing. It couldn't even break the top 100 on the charts over here. It might have been more successful, but in September, The Doors had just put out Strange Days. While their self-titled record was still on the charts, mind you, Electra's resources went into the Doors' singles and tour and getting Jim Morrison out of trouble, bailing him out of jail in New Haven, Connecticut, to the point where the label's other projects suffered. That included love. While it flew under the radar here in the States, word of mouth spreads and forever changes finds its spot in Europe. Legendary radio DJ John Peel was instrumental to this album's success in the UK. He plugged Forever Changes and A House Is Not A Motel in particular on BBC Radio 1. Jimi Hendrix helped things along too. He was over in England doing his thing with the experience at the time. He loved Forever Changes and popularized it within his circle. Fun fact, Jimi took style cues from Arthur. Forever Changes got its Europe release in February of 68 to glowing reviews, some even calling it an instant classic. But it's interesting that several of those same reviews acknowledged it wouldn't be a hit. So you might be wondering about the plot hole in all of this. How was Brian coaxed into playing on Forever Changes? Well, unbeknownst to the rest of the band, Jack Holtzman pulled Brian aside and offered him the opportunity to make a solo record if he would just finish Forever Changes. Arthur was pissed. Upon finding out Brian went behind everyone's backs to accept this deal, Arthur fired him on the spot. Johnny said this in an interview about the situation. He did what I knew he was going to do, what I didn't have the heart to do myself. Unfortunately, once again, Love shot themselves in the foot. You see, Brian was integral to their sound and their chemistry. He wrote the most successful single off Forever Changes, after all. They had this idea for the follow-up to be a jazz fusion kind of thing, but after playing some more shows, they decide to disband this lineup. No, Arthur did not fire everyone, as popular history would have you believe. They all decided to call it quits after Arthur fired Brian. Johnny said he was more integral to the group than he'd ever realized. In short, love fell apart because they took Brian for granted. Arthur assembles different iterations of love to fulfill their contract with Elektra, but... The Forever Changes lineup never reunites in full. The legacy of this album is that of kind of a hidden gem of 60s psychedelia. Artists and musicians in particular have latched on to Forever Changes. Everyone from Jimi Hendrix to Robert Plant to the Stone Roses, even Detroit rapper Danny Brown dig this thing. Now, he is an artist you would never expect me to listen to in my spare time, but I happen to really dig his stuff. 
His feature on the Brockhampton record? So good. Now here I am, some white chick from New England, with this album, by the request of all of you. So, what do I think of Forever Changes? <laughs> Going in. Before the whole Vinyl Monday thing, I had no idea the reputation that preceded Forever Changes. I only really knew about love from this kid I went to high school with, same guy who introduced me to Pink Floyd and Jimi Hendrix. I feel like this will be the next record to get the Pet Sounds treatment. They both flew under the radar in the States due to the sheer amount of stuff happening, and both were received a lot better in the UK. It's gotten a reappraisal since, but I think the full-blown Pet Sounds Renaissance treatment is still to come for Forever Changes. If I had to describe Love's sound on this record in one sentence, the sentence I'll be constructing the rest of this review around, they're an LA band giving us the best of what both the San Fran and Laurel Canyon scenes had to offer. But at the same time, it's so much more than that. Love had three songwriters, that's not very common, and one of them, Arthur, wanted to do something different with every song he wrote. This is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you have this beautifully diverse collection of tunes. There are no two that sound alike. It's country, it's folk, it's baroque pop, it's psych. That taste for eclecticism, I think that came from the San Fran scene. Forever Changes is this great big box of paints. There are so many colors and shades mixed together. There is no other record out there that sounds like Forever Changes. Very rarely do I get to say that on this series. But on the other hand, when you think of these records that have received mass reevaluations, Pet Sounds, The Rolling Stones' Aftermath, records that were so far ahead of everything else happening at the time, they all had one core unifying element. Forever Changes doesn't have that. At first, that affected my ability to get into this thing. There was no thread leading from one song to the next, and I have a very hard time finding my footing unless I'm listening really intently. Maybe that's my fault for doing a rock opera and a concept album back to back before this, I don't know. But it took me a listen or three to understand that's what Arthur was trying to do. What set love apart was all of their sounds. Maybe that's why they struggled to establish an audience in the mainstream at the time. You find one song you really like, and there's nothing else to be had. That was the wall I hit with Alone Again Or. I have to say, it's the best cut here. Way back when I first read Miss Pamela's book, I'm with the band, uh, and wrote about it on my blog, I described Alone Again Or as a cozy cabin tune. Cozy made me think, oh, this would be nestled in the middle of the album, right? Wrong. It's an unlikely opener. Alone Again Or is romantic in a tragic way. It says, I believe in free love even though I cannot have love for myself. For a band called Love, there's so little happy hippie free love in here. There's something otherworldly about this one. I'm reminded of the Italian Renaissance art term chiaroscuro. Light and shade. Alone Again Or is light and shadow balance just right. The House Is Not a Motel solo is a psych masterpiece. I cannot believe that was an accident. I'm not sure if I'm being obtuse here, but there's this same undercurrent to all the big Vietnam songs I've covered on this channel. Those are some audio jokes I haven't used in a long time. And a house is not a motel. The shared undercurrent is horror. That song is the reason Forever Changes is 
part one of the spooky series. The waters turn to blood, and if you don't think so, go turn on your tub. And if it's mixed with mud, you'll see it turn to gray. So, A House Is Not a Motel is about an AWOL soldier who turned up to this love gig. He starts talking about the war. The guys are like, ah, this guy seems a little off. We're gonna say thank you for coming and go. As soon as they start to leave, This guy tosses his gun on the table, essentially holding the band hostage until he finishes telling his story. That lyric I just read you and a few of the other vignettes are pulled directly from that soldier's story. The repeated motif of you can call my name is God speaking to soldiers on the battlefield left to die. They would cry out for God's mercy until they eventually succumb to their injuries. Once you comb through the lyrics, this song is fucking horrifying. The fantastic stomach-churning urgency of the music accents the lyrics. Johnny's warring solos stumble and fall over each other in the chaos in the dark. The rolling drum begins to feel like machine gun fire. The thing with Forever Changes is you get one or two songs on the same continuum, like Alone Again or In A House Is Not A Motel, and then we go somewhere entirely different. And now for something completely different. I pair and more again and Daily Planet together because they feel the least like love, perhaps for having the least amount of love on them. How do we know what feels like love if they experimented so much? That's a question I'm still trying to answer. And more again's strings remind me a lot of the Bee Gees 60s rock opera mess Odessa, that same kind of swelling, sappy pop, even the vocal delight delivery is screaming 60s Gib brother. The sweetness is undercut by isolation. The narrator is wrapped in armor, lost in confusion, can't let his guard down. There's shades of Laurel Canyon on Daily Planet, pretty obvious considering one of the scenes Crown Princes arranged it. But I also hear it on Old Man. The vocal melody and gentle rocking guitar pluck reminds me of something Joni Mitchell Mitchell would have written... Where do I keep my Joni Mitchell? Reminds me of something Joni Mitchell would have crafted earlier that year on Song to a Seagull, produced by David Crosby. I often hear haunting thrown around when Forever Changes comes up in the conversation. I didn't hear it for myself until this meandering listless vocal line. Red Telephone reminds me of something Sid Barrett would have written. It's cutesy in an unsettling way. Not unlike yours truly. I was not expecting Baroque pop out of Forever Changes. This thing comes up so often in the psych conversation that I was expecting, well, psych. Red Telephone got me thinking about what makes Baroque pop. Clearly, it's the instruments, harpsichord, full and beautiful instrumentals, psych in a different way. It wears a velvet cape, you know? Oh my god, my velvet cape? My Jenny Boyd velvet cape would be so cute with this. But what do the Baroque pop cornerstones, pet sounds, and my personal favorite, Odyssey and Oracle have in common. They're all terribly sad. Happy music, sad lyrics. The light inside me is dying. Arthur was observing cultural unrest in a different way than his hippie friends and neighbors were. That's apparent through the lyrics of Forever Changes. Oh, the snot has caked against my pants. It has turned into crystal. He just called them gross, which is honestly valid. I never understood the whole not showering thing. Like, I only wash my hair once every three days ish. But I wash the rest of me. Maybe the people, which I'm pretty sure is about the Sunset Strip, is frenetic. It can't find itself. It can't even finish its own train of thought. But if you just can't make the room, look up and see me on the moons of common sense around my town. Try saying that five times fast. Forever Changes can't ground itself. It has no center of gravity. And with every listen that started to throw me around live and let live and good humor man, 
I just could not settle in to observe them intently. If Daily Planet and Old Man were most Laurel Canyon, then Bummer in the Summer is the most San Fran, doing his best Marty Balin impression and everything. Finally, we have the closer, You Set the Scene. This and Alone Again Or were the perfect bookends to this record. Lyrically, it's a beautiful stream of consciousness questioning others as well as themselves. There's so much to pour over. Walk down your doorsteps, you'll take some more steps. What did you take them for? We finally get the thesis statement of the record. You go through changes, it may seem strange, is this what you're put here for? Questioning purpose is such a human struggle, and I think flower power took off the way it did in the 60s because you had so many directionless people. The song glides from movement to movement the way I've been waiting for songs to do this entire time. A big reason why I can't settle into some of these tunes. Live and Let Live, Good Humor Man, it's because they're disjointed. Here, the half walk, half shuffle of the bass line, the drums that are more mutable than they've ever been before, and a fantastic string arrangement. Finally, the pieces have locked together. And if my love of Cream's Wheels of Fire, my birthday twin album, is any indication, then you know I love a cello on a psych album. Overall, Forever Changes paints a picture of the sun setting on the hippies when they've only just began. We're still about two years out from Altamont being the death of the counterculture. I always thought it was the 68 DNC riots. This album captures the horror of not just this mass mind numbing in Arthur's eyes, but the horror of perpetually being on the outside looking in. This album is elusive. It's one of the best records you've never heard, and once you do hear it, it's one of the best records you'll never fully understand. Ideas are lobbed up in the air, never to come down. This still eludes me. It may always. Because this has no center of gravity, it swirls around itself in an endless whirlpool. It's both inside the crystal ball and the crystal ball itself. Forever Changes was, and maybe still is, ahead of its time. I can't wait to experience its arrival. My personal favorites off this one are Alone Again Or, A House Is Not A Motel, Old Man, Red Telephone, and You Set The Scene. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it! That was part one of the Vinyl Monday Spooky series. That was the 20,000 subscriber special. That was Forever Changes by Love. What do you think of this album? What do you think of love? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet might tell you, your opinion matters. Again, thank you so much for 20k. This long, strange trip is only gonna get weirder. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye!